good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Leaders of the U.S., Canada and France, Germany and Italy and the U.K. hold a call on Sunday to strategize preventing the Israel-Hamas war from spreading to the wider Middle East as diplomatic efforts continue to secure the release of more hostages. Oil and gold reverse the rally as treasuries fall, all ahead of a big week for tech earnings. Nearly $16 trillion worth of earnings hit the tape. And China cracking down on foreign firms with a series of arrests across the industry's probe into Apple supplier Foxconn. A very good morning. It's a mirror image of last Monday. Yields are rising. Curve steepeners are the trade of not just the month, but again, refreshing this morning, pushing higher on the steepeners. S&P 500 down two tenths of 1%. We have wiped out October's gains. We were down 1% on Friday. And again, Mike Wilson uh, warns over at Morgan Stanley, the view on profits, and you'll have nearly $16 trillion worth of equities coming with their prints this week, is too optimistic. You're going to have Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet, uh, along with Meta. So the big tech components are going to be there. It's certainly worth keeping an eye on what's happening geopolitically in China. As you see, arrests being made at Foxconn. Again, tech falls to a record low in China. So there is angst again in the sweeping broom of politics through private industry. Stock 600, uh, down a quarter of 1%. You've got a big deal for Roche, paying $7 billion uh, for a bid for Televan. And Philips, yes, the numbers on the top line, the guidance wasn't too bad, but, of course, the order intake was lower. Down a quarter of 1% uh, is where we stand on Philips. So, again, we're battling into, barreling into, the, I suppose, the beast of earnings. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. And it is really equities and bonds where the action is this morning. Everywhere else, it is uncertainty reigning supreme and fighting for directions. When we woke up this morning, early hours of Europe, crude was down decisively. That has ended just in the past 15 minutes. We're now little changed on WTI at $88 a barrel. There had been relief that a ground invasion seemed delayed in Gaza, but there is still plenty of concerns about escalation. RBC says for their part, should that happen, we'd add ten dollars on to crude but the durability of that rally is uncertain yen that did briefly pierce 150 it's back below that level the nikkei reporting that boj officials are looking at a ycc tweak for their upcoming meeting and finally manis we are so close to five point percent four point Nine 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 four percent is where we are on the 10-year yield. As you say, it's a carbon copy of what we saw last week. Initially, a Friday rally in bonds turns into a sell-off that we undo most of that action. And the trade is in, Manis, on that front. You mentioned this. Let me show you it in the charts. It is the steepener trade. Fives thirties is the latest part of the curve that is attempting a disinversion. I should say attempt. I shouldn't maybe say attempting because we are there. We have disinverted. We are at three. 3.2% on the 530. Should we close at that level? It would be the first time that this is in positive territory, Manus, since August of 2022. We've made five runs out of it. Will this one stick? And is twos, tens next if it does? Well, the people that I spoke to yesterday, I was, you can imagine this sort of saying furiously on a cross trainer going, do you think term premium's high enough? No, they reckon they're going to push it up and over. Do you think the steepeners will run out of breath? No, they think that they will continue. Why? Because the asset managers, this delusion that we have in media world, that the asset managers and the insurers will come in and buy duration. They do not have the convexity. Yes, don't get me to define convexity. They just don't have the appetite and the convexity to step in here and to buy these bonds. So these steepeners will run. And that is official from a treadmill near you on a Sunday afternoon in New York. I love that. The treadmills where all the action happens. All right, Manus, let's turn to some of the developments in the Middle East because the timing of a ground invasion into Gaza remains uncertain as Israel's support for diplomacy to release hostages is said to possibly delay or alter its plans. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke yesterday on the risk of escalation. We expect uh, that there's a likelihood of escalation, escalation by Iranian proxies directed against our forces, directed against our personnel. Uh, we are taking steps to make sure that we can effectively defend our people and respond decisively if we need to. This is not what we want, not what we're looking for. We don't want escalation. 
Those comments by Antony Blinken came after Arab leaders met in Egypt over the weekend. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is in Tel Aviv for us. Oliver, it's been a significant few days as it has been weeks. Where do we stand today? So a few events without precedent that happened over the weekend, which we should bear uh, as you know, fairly significant developments. The first, of course, was the hostage release of two hostages, U.S. Uh, citizens. Uh, understand that it was brokered by Qatar. Um, and again, not clear why they were released. Hamas said on humanitarian grounds, not sure, no one is exactly sure what that means or why it was them. And then the other event was that aid, aid finally crossed into Gaza, 20 trucks worth of it for the first <coughs> delivery. There was a second one on Sunday, but again, not seen really as enough. The UN is asking for something closer to 100 trucks a day in order to make a meaningful impact for a humanitarian situation that has swiftly degraded in terms of the latest with the war and what we've had over the last couple of days. The main theater of war remains in Gaza. There has been repeated pummeling by Israeli forces from the air un into the ground. But there is also more fighting going on in Lebanon, and the Israelis are evacuating more and more civilians, tens and tens of thousands of them, from the Lebanese border. And just anecdotally, from being here in Tel Aviv, where you're some distance from these front lines, the hotel where I'm staying at two weeks ago, it was mostly uh, people who had evacuated from the south. Now, more and more, it's people who are evacuating from the north that are staying there. And this is the escalation by the proxies from Iran, and that is perhaps the, their biggest concern of all multiple fronts is what uh, the Israelis don't want to be battling on. Um, Oli, also the narrative seems to have adjusted in terms of the ground invasion. Is that in hopeful anticipation of further uh, hostages being released, or is it a full-scale review of what Israel does next? I think that, so again, I think it's very difficult to guess what Israel is going to do next and how all of these inputs come in there. From our reporting, we understand the a hostage conversation and the back room diplomatics are definitely playing a role in this. But remember, Manus, this is a very complex equation, and the result is, for the Israelis, without a doubt, the dismantling of Hamas and the neutralizing of its military um, capabilities. However, all of the inputs of this equation are, yes, the hostages. It's going to also be, um, it's going to be aid as a result, but also there's the moral imperative of minimizing civilian casualties, but also the political imperative of having to do that in order to have continued support from the international community. And as you mentioned there in the introduction, the Arab summit over the weekend, I want to read you something because we didn't get any sort of real concrete outcomes there, but there was a real voicing of different views on this. And we heard from King Abdullah of Jordan, the message the message the Arab world is hearing is loud and clear. This is from the Western world. Palestinian lives matter less than Israeli ones. Our lives matter less than other lives. And that is a very dangerous message to get out. That is what he said. Of course, the Western participants of this summit said, listen, we have full support of Israel. However, they need to conduct themselves within the parameters of international law. So, Oliver, what will the next 24 hours bring? What does it look like? I think that one of the things, the things we can predict and the things that we can't, the things that we cannot predict but we really need to pay close attention to are what Blinken was warning about, more attacks potentially on U.S. military installations. They're sending more air defense uh, units into the region, putting more soldiers on high alert. So that will be one of the things we watch. In terms of the things that we can anticipate, right now as we speak, there is a screening going on of four journalists of footage that was collected from the Hamas attackers. A huge volume of that is being shown to journalists right now as we speak. Some of that is going to be released. Again, what is all down to temperature and rage and anger, this is going to be part of the conversation. On the diplomacy front, we have Mark Rutte, who is going to be here, the prime minister of the Netherlands. He's going to meet with Netanyahu, but also Mahmoud Abbas. We await Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, who will be here tomorrow. And then the final thing we're going to watch, again, this has been sort of on the back burner is the economic consequences of this war on the Israeli economy. We have a rate decision from the Israelis a little later today. There will be a press conference where there will surely be a lot of questions about what the longer term economic impact of this war is three weeks now into it. That was a, a, a pretty uh, powerful speech by King Abdullah and it's certainly one uh, that, that is worth watching because he talks about the rage and he talks about this not being uh, what sh must dictate what happens next and the status quo. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly a, a very big insight there. Oliver, thank you very much. Oliver Cook in Tel Aviv. Dana, we need to circle back just uh, to the main, main uh, mover in these markets and it is, of course, 10-year government bond yields. They've now topped 5%. They were just kissing that level, uh, as you said a little bit earlier on. So we're above at 5% for the first time since 2007. So this is, again, joining the multi-decade highs uh, and, again, being pushed along 
by these curve steepeners that you so clearly identified and we're turning into positive territory there uh, potentially on some of those curve uh, disinversions. Let's pivot to China. The authorities there are again shaking the confidence of foreign companies with a series of arrests across industries and an investigation into Foxconn. That's Apple's most important supplier. Joining us now with the details is Alex Webb. Alex, uh, we had this sort of massive investigations uh, into wealth management, into financial products, uh, and, and really the world had thought that we'd move past massive intervention. But these latest probes may say something quite significant about the zeitgeist of China. Good morning. Yeah, so the main one really here is, is the Foxconn investigation. And as ever, the regulators tend to be relatively coy about the exact reasons for what's going on. What local media reporting is that they are conducting tax audits into Foxconn and reviewing its land use. Uh, there is also an investigation some employees LPP. That's to do with media purchasing. Again, we don't fully know the details. The Foxconn one really is the big one right now. We've seen a certain amount of... Um, push back towards Apple. Of course, Fox, Apple is Foxconn's biggest customer. They make iPhones as well, of course, as PlayStations and plenty more besides. Uh, the question is whether this is really about targeting Apple and its supply chain, or there could be um, a Taiwanese political element here. Terry Gu, the founder of Foxconn, is running to be president of, of Taiwan. Um, so is this uh, an effort to wield some influence in this territory, in this country, which they deem a territory of, uh, of China and trying to, to, to mess with that a little bit? C considering, Alex, that there's some geopolitics, a geopolitical element to this, does this reignite those worries for foreign companies? Does it reignite worries for Apple specifically? Yes, yeah, so absolutely on both counts, right? We've seen a, a slowing of in foreign direct investment in China, um, a lot of it to do with the way that they have targeted their own tech companies in recent years and tried to rein in their power. We think about Alibaba in particular. Um, but when you look at Apple, they have enjoyed something of a symbiotic relationship with China over the years. They employ indirectly millions of people there to manufacture <clears throat> their devices. But it's also 20% of Apple's total sales in China. That is a, a percentage that we've seen increase over the years. It has been growing more quickly than some of those other markets. It's now facing slightly stronger headwinds, stronger competition from Huawei than they've had in the past few years. We saw a new device which is supposed to be challenging the iPhone 15 and, and that lineup. Uh, the question is whether it can make enough of, the, enough of them to be able to compete with Apple or whether it's really symbolic. There have, of course, been constraints on China's own technological capabilities from the U.S. There's suspicion that some of this pushback from China is in reaction to the U.S. efforts. Okay. Alex, thank you very much for that. That is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. All right, some breaking lines to give you some deal news. Chevron has agreed to buy Hess. It's for an $171 per share all stock deal. That puts the valuation of this deal, the size of this deal, at $43 billion. The total EV of Hess then becomes $60 billion, including debt. It's a 5% premium to the close. And she just mentioned this is the second major deal in this oil industry in just a few weeks. Exxon has had bought Pioneer for $58 billion. Man, it's not that long ago. Yeah, who said the investment bankers weren't going to, you know, pull the, pull, pull the ka-ching, ka-ching before the uh, end of the year. But that is a, a pretty monster deal. Bonds above 5%. We'll discuss that with our next guest in just a moment. Ring the bell. 2007 was a hell of a year, but it got bumpy. Good morning from New York. Monday. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Manus Cranny in New York. Manus, you said ring the bell. I'm going to say release the balloons because we have hit a milestone 5% on your 10 year Treasury yield. That's the first time that has happened since 2007. Well, we're either on Joining our way to heaven or hell. <laughs> Yes, very well put, Manus. Uh, what an interesting Monday we're having. And joining us to discuss is Sandra Horsfield, economist at Investec. Sandra, here we are, 5% on, uh, on the 10-year yields, first time since 2007. Is this now finally the screaming buy that we've been waiting for in duration? 
It's very confident, difficult to be confident at this point exactly where you might like to call the top on yields. When is the time to buy? Certainly, uh, if you're looking at things like inflation trends, they have been pointing down. The economy, however, has been holding up very much, and there's the supply picture to take into account as well. How do you balance this? I think markets are trading very carefully, uh, and there's a lot of nervousness still around. That nervousness, Sandra, good morning to you. Um, what we're trying to understand is whether curve steepeners, and Danny started the show with this, she showed uh, five, five, I think it was at two thirties, uh, almost mm. in positive territory. What goes through my mind and the questions I was asking to people yesterday on a treadmill, which was, do duration hunters come in here? Can you stand in front of the velocity of this steepener? Do the steepeners just continue? And does that cause you as a bond duration buyer to hold your powder dry? Because these steepeners look as if they're set to run further. I think what we had um, is quite different trends here. For a while, it was all about the short end of the curve. We had the expectation that um, interest rates uh, would have to uh, stay higher for longer and that uh, drove the short end higher. Now it's sort of more the long end of the curve too where expectations have moved up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot less clear perhaps exactly where that one might stop. Perhaps there's more of a natural anchor uh, if you think on the short end of the curve than on the long end of the curve. Um, certainly in the, in the cyclical perspective, we have to take that into account. And the supply picture isn't very pretty. So I think that is where the overall nervousness comes from. And that is why it is so difficult to uh, really call the top here for yields uh, at the very long end of the curve. And, and what's made this steepening so unusual, that we are seeing this bear steepening led by the long end, does that mean that the historical evidence that this is when we enter a recession, when the curve finally normalizes, that it doesn't apply in the same vein just because the, the shape of the curve is looking different than, than historically how this plays out? It's, we've gone through a very strange period in a way uh, because we have had this inverted yield curve for such a long period of time and we didn't get the recession that uh, normally you might have seen in this sort of circumstance. So what is going on uh, here going forward is, is really a, a question of how um, the economy reacts. And higher long-term yields by themselves tighten financial conditions. So companies will face higher borrowing costs for the long end, not just short-term rolling over uh, of debt. And that could slow the economy in its own right. And um, that will mm. be a factor that certainly the Fed and others will have to take into account. Sandra, one other thought we want to get from you. Obviously, dollar-yen um, breaking through 150. Everybody's on intervention watch. Let, let's wait and see. But the bigger issue is this, of course. Japan holds over a trillion dollars worth of U.S. treasuries. The Nikkei is floating the idea that YCC may be tweaked or changed earlier than we all think. That's the latest from them this morning. If and when that Damascene moment comes from Japan... What is the repercussion of repatriation? Will it be slow and, 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 and let's say, paceful, or will it be much more brutal? It's a very good question. Uh, certainly one we haven't had to actually face. It's been theoretically discussed for some time. I think what we are going to see is certainly more flows and more pressures uh, from that side uh, as well. We have to remember the Japanese authorities will want to tread carefully as well. Mm -hmm. For them domestically to destabilize the bond market is a problem as well. There's a lot of Japanese uh, domestic debt out there and certainly would cause big problems if there were to be a too large and too quick a rise in yields domestically as well. So uh, I think that will all be factored into the equation and since okay. a relatively cautious move is more likely. OK, Sandra, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, as 10-year government bond yields break through 5% for the first time since 2007. What are the repercussions uh, across global bond markets? We have this, uh, this uh, disinversion going on in the U.S. curve. Yields are rising across. We have the ECB this week. Consensus is for no further hikes. 10-year uh, government bond yields rise, but it is supply that is perhaps the most anxious issue in 10-year government bond markets this morning right here on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Cranny in New York with Danny Berger at London HQ. The reason why I'm slightly chuckling, apparently there was a dog parade 
<laughs> for Halloween. The things that I learned I can't you missed about it. New York culture and zeitgeist. I wonder why there were so many puppy powers out and about, but apparently that's it. But we've got much bigger breaking news uh, in terms of the bond market. Never mind the dogs. <laughs> We do. I'm, I'm just trying to think if Manus Cranny had a dog, he'd somehow figure out how to dress it in a disinverted yield curve. I know he would. But here is, here is where we are on the 10-year yield. Manus, this is a big move. Nine basis points. We've done it. It's happened. We have crossed 5% on your 10-year yield. Well, we've done 40 basis points in the space of a month. So, so the question is this. Um, how much pain from the bond market can the equity market take in a week that, and we'll recap this, there's some big numbers coming out this week uh, in terms of the equity market, but this spike above 5% is going to be deleterious. There's my new word for the week. Deleterious mm. to the... Mm. To the growth, to the growth <laughs> stock narrative, but of course, it's how much more term premium do the bond markets and bond hunters want to own treasuries? That is the debate. How much further beyond zero will it go? Danny, good morning. You get everything. Dogs morning, and, and deleterious. <laughs> I, I hope the kids are watching this program for their SAT prep because because you're certainly helping out a lot for the vocab section. <laughs> OK, we're going to return to our top story in just a moment. Geopolitics around the world focused on Israel. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Granny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what you need to know. Leaders of the U.S., Canada, France, Germany, Italy and the U.K. hold a Sunday call to strategize on preventing the Israel-Hamas war from spreading to the wider Middle East. That's as diplomatic efforts continue to secure the release of more hostages. Oil and gold reverse their rally as treasuries fall, all ahead of a big week of tech earnings with nearly $16 trillion worth of earnings on deck. And China cracks down on foreign firms with a series of arrests across industries and a probe into Apple supplier Foxconn. Manis, I'm going to get through my first two assets really quick because there's only one thing we care about, and it is bonds. Crude, that falls, reversing the gain from Friday. Dollar yen briefly tested 150, and here's exactly what I wanted to get to. We are back above 5%, Manis, on your U.S. 10-year yield. This is the first time since 2007. It also means that this curve steep this disinversion, this normalization gets kicked into hyperdrive. The other concern with this man is not just what it means for your portfolio, but what it means from the Fed. They've been pretty sanguine. We heard from Jay Powell. He was pretty sanguine about the idea of higher yields, meaning they can do less work. But at what point do we look at this and say the Fed has lost control? They've lost the grip of the long end. And with mortgage rates above 8 percent, it could unduly tighten this American economy. Well, the question is, have they lost the, the, the grip? on the language and, and, and the guidance. The market just simply uh, mm. does not believe that it can absorb the supply. We haven't got a clearing price. FCON is tightening. Uh, and the bond market is doing the dirty work for the Fed. That is the narrative, isn't it? Let's just check in on equities because the bond market may be spiking high. The equity market is choking. It's got $16 trillion worth of equity report cards to deal with this week from Microsoft uh, through to Apple and Amazon. We're down a half of 1%. Uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, Mr. Wilson there says, again, the market market in terms of the profit views, uh, they're just too high. So right now there is pressure on these equity markets. Uh, there was all of October's gains were gone. We're down 1% on Friday. We're down 1.5% now in the space of two trading sessions. The Chinese uh, are back at the sort of turning the screws down. They've made arrests in a Foxconn probe. Uh, and of course, that has shaken confidence. That's the close in China. But again, it's a deep-seated concern about another round uh, of arrests and intervention in China. Europe is floundering, down seven-tenths of one percent, despite the deal-making news from Roche and Phillips. Phillips came out with a guidance on where they would get to, which was a little bit better, but their order book is under pressure. Phillips, uh, Roche is down a third of one percent. Phillips at the moment is down nearly two percent on the back of the order book. So right now what you've got is a fairly tough position to grapple with this move higher in global bond rates, Danny, and therein lies the vexation for these markets. 
And, and it's important to note that this is being led by a sell-off on the long end. Manis, you and, I, you and I have been talking about this, about the rapidity of the disinversion of the curve. I'm looking at 230s right now. We are just below 4.5 percent. We are easily positive, Manis. Should that happen, should it close there, it would be the first time since August 2022. Well, the question is, is there enough term premium to induce the, the duration hunters to come into the market? and pick up. We can debate that uh, through the rest of the morning. To our top story, uh, Danny, which is, of course, the Israel-Hamas war. We're joined now by uh, our opinion columnist, Bobby Ghosh. Bobby, good to have you with us. Uh, this morning, uh, when we were going home on Friday, the consensus was around a significant ground invasion. That seems to have been held back. Two hostages have been released. Were are we now? We have had Biden on calls with the Western allies. We've had a gathering of the Arab nations in, in Egypt. This ground assault, uh, this invasion seems to have changed in perspective, timing and construct. Your take. Good morning. Good morning. And Manus, there's a lot of pressure on the Israelis to hold off, to restrain themselves from the United States primarily, but from the wider world, I would say, um, cautioning against the ground invas invasion for all kinds of reasons. Um, for First and foremost, for humanitarian reasons. All these images that we're seeing now, uh, the, the destruction wrought on Gaza uh, is basically has shocked the world. Even by the standards of the region, this is extraordinarily uh, massive destruction. Um, then there's the matter of the hostages, as you mentioned. There are more than 200 of them and from many countries around the world, most of them Israelis, but plenty of others, including some Americans, which is why the President uh, Biden has himself been putting pressure on the Israelis to restrain themselves in the knowledge that if they go in on the ground offensive, quite aside from hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, also those hostages will be uh, in harm's way. And then, of course, there's the question of strategy and tactics for battle. The big difference between mm. Israel's previous uh, ground invasions and this one, again, those hostages. Israel needs to know where they are, needs to figure out how best to avoid hitting uh, places where they might be. This greatly complicates any planning for the operation. The, the ground invasion will come. Eventually it will come because the pressure on Netanyahu from his own people is really quite great and right. his own instinct, our instincts are to go in with the ground invasion. But he is being restrained by all sorts of different pressures. And, 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 and Bobby, what happens, what is the risk of, and, and what changes in the contours of this conflict should a new northern front open? Should escalation with Hezbollah and Lebanon turn into something greater than it is at this point? Well, that has been the concern from day one. What happens if Hezbollah enters the fight? So far, Hezbollah has satisfied itself by lobbying the occasional rocket, the occasional missile in the direction of Israel um, and keeping Israel on its toes and, and not going any farther than that. But the decision about whether Hezbollah joins the fight will not necessarily be made in Lebanon. More than likely, it will be made in Tehran. Iran is the main backer, not just of Hamas, but also of Hezbollah. Iran has a major role to play here. Iran wants to keep Israel off balance. Iran wants to, do, uh, wants to hurt Israel. Right now, it is achieving that result just uh, through the operation in Gaza. It has dragged Israel into this... Uh, operation. It is basically Israel's image in the world is being affected by these video uh, and these images coming out of Gaza. That all suits Iran perfectly well. At some point, Iran will have to make the calculation about whether or not it is worth its while to throw its other forces into the fight. Rationally, you'd think they wouldn't. They don't need to. But Iran doesn't always act rationally. and That's what keeps everybody guessing. We had a peace gathering in Cairo. It was very well televised. Um, a very impassioned speech by King Abdullah. Yeah. Um, talking about the value of life. Um, and depending on the context of where, of where you sit, there is the, the, the view in his words about the virtual silence of the West. There was one message for the Ukraine war and another message for this situation. But you say the gathering was virtually pointless. Why? Well, it was important symbolically, and, and King Abdullah's speech uh, underscored that. The, 
the, important to remind the whole world. I thought world, it was a great context. It, it was indeed. And it's important to remind the world that vast numbers, really large numbers, two million plus innocent people, civilians in Gaza, are caught in the middle of yes. this. So that was very important. But in the context of trying to move the needle mm -hmm. on the conflict itself, I don't think it achieved anything. First and foremost, the four most important protagonists whose contributions will matter the most in, in ending the, the, the war were not there. There was no Israel, mm -hmm. no representative of Hamas, no United States, and no Iran. Without these four at the table, metaphorically speaking, there's not going to be any progress. The second thing was that the conference didn't end with any kind of a peace plan. It, 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 it sort of was a, was a rousing, an emotional moment. It was a very emotional was, event, wasn't it? Correct. Yep. And, and there was a lot of expressions of, of, of sympathy and, and the importance of, of humanitarian mm -hmm. uh, effort. But there was no actual roadmap to say, here's what needs to happen, here's what we want to see the two sides to do, beyond just saying, well, there should be a ceasefire. Bobby, what about further plans with Egypt and Israel when it comes to aid? We know the importance that that crossing plays for that. We've seen the first amount of aid due to cross in to Gaza. Is there hopes that there will be more and that it will, again, do make some sort of ground to aid those, those two million innocent civilians in a time of need right now? Well, there has to be more. The, 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 the aid that has been allowed to go through Rafa is, is a trickle, I mean, a couple of dozen trucks uh, at a time. In normal times, there are more than 100 trucks going just to keep Gaza going. In a normal time, not in the middle of a war when the need for food, shelter, uh, medicines is so great, fuel is so great. There has to be more. And that's the other part of the, the pressure from the international community on Israel saying, you've got to allow much more uh, supplies to go through. There are complications. It is, after all, a war zone. Some of the roads inside uh, Gaza have been badly damaged by bombing. And then there's Hamas. We don't know whether it suits Hamas's purpose to allow uh, these supplies in. Hamas uh, benefits from its own people being seen as victims. Uh, Hamas victimizes these people in its own self, in its own sort of uh, uh, so perverse calculations, um, it may not suit Hamas's purpose to allow uh, more supplies in. But they're essential, they're crucial, they're, as you say, to, uh, two million people there who desperately need them. Bobby, thank you very much for joining us this thank morning. You. That is Bobby Ghosh of Bloomberg Opinion. Now let's get some other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. And Republicans have unveiled nine candidates in an effort to end the House Speaker deadlock. The GOP will return to Washington on Monday for a Speaker's candidate forum at 6.30 p.m. And the, is set to start the election process on Tuesday, Manus. Argentina heads to a presidential runoff election vote as the economy minister uh, defied expectations against libertarian outsider Javier Milay. Massa secured 37% of the votes against Milay's 30%. The decisive vote for the president comes next month on November the 19th. And in deal news, Roche will buy drug ma maker Televant for $7.1 billion. Roche will add the developer of inflammatory bowel disease treatments to its roster of experimental medicines. The deal marks the company's largest acquisition since 2014. Uh, Manis, a few quick markets to look at. Worth checking the Israeli market because we're now looking at the shekel set for its longest run of losing streaks since 1984. There will be a Bank of Israel meeting today. Mm. They're expected to hold rates steady. Yeah, they're going to give us the, the first, uh, I suppose, data implications on, on the accounting for the toll on the economy from the conflict of the Israel-Hamas war. Uh, and of course, uh, what will they do? Uh, almost all economists predict a pause in place since July. So we're looking at 4.75% for two straight meetings. I mean, that is after 10 straight hikes that we've had. And uh, of course, we spoke to the former central bank governor uh, and she was saying, look, there's enough arsenal in the central bank to defend uh, the reserves are robust. They are there. Mm. Uh, and we know that they will use up to, what is it, 30 billion. Uh, that is the number uh, that they put out there. But of course, bonds is where the key story for the world is this morning. Danny. Yeah, we had that crossover from above 5% for your 10-year yield. That's the first time that's happened since 2007. 
It's now moved 10 basis points, Manus. We got an extra basis point while we've been talking over the past 10 minutes. This is some real velocity we've seen in this move. They gained on Friday, and as you started the show saying, a carbon copy, a complete redo of last Monday when the gains on Friday turn into losses come Monday. Indeed, we've got the ECB this week, so all eyes down to see what the narrative is from Christine Lagarde uh, and her cohort. Yields rise around the world. Good morning from New York and London on Bloomberg Brief. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manus Cranny is in New York. Manus, for the second time in just a week, we've seen the yen test and breach 150. We are just below that level at this moment. There is a big options barrier there, so it's not unusual to see that continue to be back down. Last time this happened, we were, the world was a, a flood of speculation risk that, according to Bloomberg's own internal calculation, did seem unlikely at the time. Is that risk reappearing now? Joining us is Bloomberg's Ven Ram. Ven, we've had this test yet again of 150 as we head into a week of a BOJ decision next week. Dollar yen 150. I mean, is this something that's going to get the MOF concerned or is it more about the volatility and the pace of losses? I think the MOF is concerned uh, uh, by the per, by the level per se of the yen. For a long time, they've been they've known their displeasure. They've made known their displeasure about uh, a yen level at 150. That seems to be the line in the sand for them. But having said that, the BOJ isn't on the same page with the Ministry of Finance because the BOJ, from the BOJ's perspective, a weaker yen means uh, more steadfast inflation, of course, and they would want that. So the BOJ is not sweating bullets about the week again. What that means is that we could easily get to 153, uh, which was the previous record low that we have seen in this cycle. Now, I mean, Treasury yields, you have just saying that it's gone past 5%. And if that continues and real and nominal rates continue to diverge in favor of the dollar, the yen is going to cop it. And uh, so it's, it's, it's not just about the volatility. It's also about the level for the MOF very much. I love the way you put it, it's the yen that's going to cop it. I, I mean, the other thing, we've done the M Live survey in terms of yield curve control. The Nikkei floats the, the issue again in, in the papers over the past 24 hours. We put it to a guest earlier that maybe one of the biggest tail risks, there you go, there's the M Live survey, um, which asset class will suffer the most from rising JGB yields? And it is, of course, uh, ultimately U.S. Treasuries. That is, they, Japan owns over a trillion dollars worth of Treasuries. The Chinese are selling them. You've got fiscal disarray. You've got political disarray. You've got supply uh, are plentiful. And then if the Japanese pull the ripcord on YCC, that could drain a, another natural buyer of Treasuries. Or, is, or am I just too close to Armageddon? Well, I do think that's a, that makes for a great storyline, but I don't think it's going to quite work out that way, Manus, because I don't think that the ba Bank of Japan is going to, even assuming that they're going to tweak yield curve control, even if uh, even if we assume that they're going to do away with negative rates, you know, we are just going to get fractionally positive rates, if at all, in Japan. Mm. And that doesn't mean that we're going to give up 5% yield on treasuries and come back to 0%. It makes it that much more uh, alluring, for sure, mm -hmm. but... You know, that, that's, that, that's not to say that the gap is going to be bridged anytime soon. And therefore, I don't think, I mean, where I think it will have a real impact is on the FX side of equation. And there, I think that the dollar is overbought, it's over resilient, and the yen is extremely cheap on a real effective, just hmm. real effective exchange rate basis. It's extremely cheap. And I think it has a cause to correction. So I think that the bigger moves you will see are in the FX, not on the rate side. Well, what does that mean then for this narrative that is there are no buyers for bonds right now? Supply is ramping up considering the fiscal issuance that we've seen. China isn't buying. They fled U.S. assets to a record in August. And then the other part of that story has also been Japanese investors are at some point going to cease to buy treasuries. Is what you're telling me that that narrative is, is not as clean as maybe we assumed? 
Well, I do think that, you know, if you look at, you know, there, there's, where is the marginal buyer of Treasury going to come from? It's going to come from portfolio managers who think that the we are done on the rate uh, hiking cycle, and we are not at that point yet. I mean, the U.S. economy is wagging its tail, and it's wagging a mighty strong tail at this point, because, you know, the U.S. economy is pretty resilient, the labor market is tight. I mean, you've, the Fed has tightened rates phenomenally in this cycle, but the economy has taken it pretty much in its stride, as Jerome Powell said last week. As long as that continues to be the case, the marginal case for buying the dollar, the marginal buyer of the of the treasuries is going to be a bit more hesitant. And, you know, they've been bitten before. We have seen yields come back from 330 on the 10-year to 5% now. Mm -hmm. And all, all those who bought it then have suffered losses, immense losses. And there is no conviction in the market right now that we are done. So, so that, that is going to keep the market on the defensive. Well, the stocks are down for the fifth day in a row uh, in the U.S., the longest losing streak since December 2022. I found a fact. Uh, very quickly, Treasury's above 5%. Are we on our way to heaven or hell? <laughs> I think we are on a short-term way to hell, on, uh, which then leads <laughs> on to heaven. So that's, <laughs> that's the path I see. I don't think either of them are I don't wow. think any of this is heaven at all. I don't know why I'm chuckling. It's just a nervous laugh, really. <laughs> I also don't think a, a short-term stop to hell really uh, is a good thing. Whether or not you end up in heaven, heaven afterwards, that doesn't sound great. Ben, I think we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. That is Bloomberg's Ben Ram. All right, Manis, let's take a quick check on currencies. As we were just talking about that yen, nudging up to 150. Ben says it could easily go to 153 with the BOJ not caring too much about that drift lower in the yen. Sterling takes a beating down a tenth of 1% as king dollar remains supreme. Now, coming up, we're going to take a look at some of the market moving events to watch throughout the day as S&P 500 futures dip as those higher yields above 5% really challenge us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manis has gone to go set up with the surveillance team, so you'll see him just a few minutes' time. All right, let's get you set up for your trading week with a look at what's ahead. And it's an earnings bonanza. Tech giants Microsoft and Alphabet, they'll both report on Tuesday after the bell. And then we'll get IBM and Meta. Those earnings hit on Wednesday also after the bell with U.S. No new home sales on the same day. And Amazon and IBM, they report on Thursday. Also on Thursday, we have that ECB rate decision and numbers for U.S. GDP. So it is a big week, but already a big day when it comes to some of these stocks because we have some deal news. I should say the second big oil deal to happen in less than two weeks. Chevron and Hess, they will be, uh, uh, that's what's under focus right now. Chevron is buying Hess for $53 billion. That is an EV of $60 billion, $171 per share for an all stock transaction. Then we're also looking at Apple pre market under pressure down more than 1.4%. Han Hai, those shares dove in the China session after probe started. Reportedly, arrests were also made. But I should say, it is not just Apple. It is not just China. Japan is investigating Google over alleged antitrust violations. So we're seeing Alphabet shares down nearly 1%. There are also some European movers to keep your eye on some earnings. We had Volkswagen. This was a prelim report. Those figures came late Friday, third quarter EBIT below estimates, higher production wing on company costs, and Philips. Also, comparable orders falling in the third quarter. Now, we're also looking at a 10-year yield breaking above 5% in a move of 10 basis points. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>